Good morning all and a happy new year 2017. Hmm, so what are we going to do? Well, flash some LEDs, obviously, but uh, today let's do it slightly differently. Let's do it using a Z80 CPU. And uh, I've got lots of Z80 CPUs because uh, I was heavily into the Z80 back in the 80s. Uh, it's kind of where my youth got misspent. But uh, I've got a, quite a collection here, covered in dust, some of them, because they haven't seen the light of day for 20 years. But yeah, lots of Z80s. Now, this looks like quite an intimidating chip. I mean, 40 pins. Seriously, how easy is it going to be to get this to flash some LEDs? Well, it turns out it's not that hard. Stick it in a breadboard, put a few LEDs on some pins and some resistors, and we got ourselves some uh, flashing lights, an orange one there and a green one. And on the blue lights, you can see it's counting up in a binary sequence. So, uh, yeah, not too hard. But let's go right back to the beginning and uh, see how this is done. Now, of course, you can't just expect to uh, plug a Z80 CPU into a breadboard and it just works. We do need to do some research. What we need is some data. And I just happen to have this fantastic original Zilog Z80 CPU manual. And uh, in here we've got the Z80 CPU architecture, uh, register summary. What else have we got? Ah, pinouts. Now that's going to be very important. We need to know how to connect the various pins, what all the pins do. And timing diagrams and waveforms. We're going to need these too. So what I've done is I've plonked a Zilog Z80 CPU. Now this is actually a Z80, not a Z80A. So this is the original 2.5 megahertz product. I've plonked it on one of these MB102 breadboards. I'm really liking these breadboards because you've got the positive and negative on both sides. I've linked those across with a couple of wires and I've built a clock because the Z80 CPU needs to be clocked. Now this has a maximum of 2.5 megahertz. That's not going to bother me too much today because I'm going to be driving it at about five or six hertz. Uh, this is just a 555 timer in a stable mode. So free running multi vibrator oscillator mode. Um, resistor between seven and eight, resistor between seven and six. Now I've implemented that as a pot because it's just easier. It spans those pins very neatly and it allows you a little bit of um, flexibility to tweak the frequency. Although if you turn this, you do find that the mark space ratio varies a bit. Um, I've got a capacitor there between pins one and two. So that's setting the clock speed. And then there's a link jumping from pin six across to pin two. So classic uh, clock mode, multi-vibrator mode, LED on pin three of the 555. So that's just showing the output, oscillating, switching on and off. OK, so first things first, Z80 CPU, uh, we're going to need some power. So five volts goes to pin 11 and ground goes to pin 29. Right, so we've got to count now. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11. Right, pin 11 just happens to be marked 11, even though my numbering is going the other way. So what was it? Uh, five volts to pin 11. And this is where this MB102 breadboard is quite handy because I've got a positive down on this lower side, which you wouldn't have on a breadboard that has the single bus line. So five volts to pin 11. That looks like it fits there. Right, ground to pin 29. So there are 20 pins on each side. So that's uh, one, because there's the ident marker. Uh, yeah, you can just see that in the light. So that's pin 20. This is pin 21, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So it's just above where it has a PS. Uh, right, we have this strange phi symbol on pin 6. And phi says single phase TTR level clock, which requires only a 330 ohm pull up resistor to plus 5 volts to meet all clock requirements. Hmm, interesting. I didn't bother with the 330 ohm pull up resistor. And it seemed to work fine. Right, so we want the clock output from the 555 to go to the Z80's pin 6. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's put that in there and stick that on the output of the clock. So that's it. The CPU is powered up. 
and it's being clocked by my 5 or 6 hertz clock. Hmm, now how are we going to see what's going on? Well, one of the signals that we could look at is this M1 signal on pin 27. And down here it says M1 is machine cycle 1. It's an output, it's active low. Uh, M1 indicates that the current machine cycle is the op code fetch cycle of an instruction execution. So I've made up some uh, LEDs which have a little resistor soldered to the cathode. Uh, so that will be the most negative end. So I'm going to use this yellow LED to take a look at that M1 signal. So let's plug that one in. So it goes on to uh, pin 27. That's two back from the ground pin, uh, the zero volts, which is pin 29. Now I'm going to put the resistor, um, which is the anode, actually to the M1 signal. Uh, no, it's the cathode, sorry. And the anode I'm going to put to positive because I want the LED to come on when the M1 signal goes low because it's active low. In other words, when it goes low, we are in machine cycle one and that's what I want to see. So let's put that in positive and as I say, the resistor, the cathode end, which is the little flat on the LED goes to that M1 and let's see what happens. Switch on. Oh, it's flashing. So we've made a start. We do have a flashing LED. Uh, but that only flashed a few times and then it stopped. So what's going on? Has the CPU crashed? In fact, do we know what this thing is doing at all? Well, we don't really because there's lots of other signals here that we need to deal with. So let's take a look at some of those. What we really need to sort out are these inputs because they're going to actually affect the way the CPU runs. So wait, for example, tells the CPU to just do nothing for a while to extend some of its pulse widths. So we need to make sure uh, it's not waiting. This is an active low signal, so we need to pull that high. Now the CPU uses NMOS, which is sort of half CMOS, but it does use um, MOSFETs and their gates float. So what we need to do is make sure that we don't leave them just open circuit. We need to tie them either high or low. So to deactivate this wait signal, I'm gonna tie it high. Now I'm going to use 1K resistors. Um, it's probably not a good idea to tie anything directly to 5 volts or even directly to 0 volts, but a 1K resistor will pull it fairly hard up uh, and fairly hard down if you connect it to 0 volts. It's just a safe option, really. So uh, pin 24, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, positive. Let's put that in there. So that means that the CPU is never going to execute a wait state. Uh, 16 and 17 are interrupt and non-maskable interrupt, respectively. Uh, we don't really want to invoke the interrupt system of the CPU because that gets quite complicated and what we're doing here is anything but complicated. So I'm going to tie both 16 and 17 uh, to 5 volts using 1K resistors. Uh, so there they are, pins 16 and 17, both pulled up to positive. Another reason why this MB102 prototyping board is rather good because I can uh, pull pins this side to positive or this side to positive. It's really good. Okay, so now what else have we got? Reset. Ah, now we certainly don't want that floating about. So 26 needs to be pulled high because again, that's an active low signal. That's what the bar running across the top means. And bus request. Now this is an interesting one. If you pull bus request low, the Z80 says, oh, okay, you can have all my buses. The 16-bit uh, address bus, the 8-bit data bus and a whole bunch of these control signals will all go tri-state and the CPU says, oh, just take over, I'm, I'm out of the equation. This is for DMA, direct memory access. So this is for when other peripherals, for example, a floppy disk controller would just take over the bus, the CPU would go quiet and the floppy disk controller would write directly to RAM. It's just a quicker way of doing it than passing every byte through the CPU. So uh, reset 26, bus request 25, both pulled to five volts. So that's dealt with uh, power and the clock input and all these control inputs, which I've just pulled all high. Now everything else is either an output, these are all outputs, the address bus are all outputs, uh, or the data bus, which is bi-directional, but it will only be uh, an input if the CPU is doing a read. So uh, let's try that now and see what happens. Let's switch it on. Oh, just the one flash. That's not very impressive, is it? So in some ways, I've made it worse. But we are getting to the point 
where the CPU is going to do something intelligent. Now, one critically important difference between a microprocessor like the Z80 and a microcontroller is that the microprocessors don't have any program memory. So the Z80 has no program to execute. Now, back in the days of the Z80, the most popular option for program memory was the EEPROM, the Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. Now, generally speaking, this is a read-only memory. You can't write to it um, unless you go through a special sequence and apply a special programming voltage. And you can see that this one actually has it written on there. VPP, the programming voltage, is 12.5 volts. So if you put 12.5 volts on one of these pins, I can't remember for the life of me uh, which one it was, and then go through a special sequence of toggling the control lines, you can write data into this thing only once, and then this becomes programmed and read only, and then the CPU will read its program instructions from this memory. The only way you can erase those program instructions and put new ones in is to shine ultraviolet light through this little glass window. But this is all going to be a bit of a hassle because we need to connect, um, I think it's 15 of these address lines to the EEPROM, all of the eight data bus lines, uh, half a dozen control signals. That's just going to create a spaghetti of wires. And I don't really want to go down that route. So I'm going to build a pseudo ROM. So I'm going to build something that behaves like this ROM, but just with these eight resistors. Now, if I programmed this ROM so that every single memory location had the same data in it, I could fake that by just putting resistors into the breadboard so that every time the CPU reads an instruction, it just reads the same one. So the question is, which instruction am I going to program into my ROM? Well, I'm going to do this one, no op, no operation. And the data for that is very simple. It's zero, zero. So I want the CPU to read in on its data bus, zero, zero. Well, that's actually very easy. I just tie all eight of these data bus lines down to ground. I'm going to do it using 1K resistors because the data bus on a Z80 is bi-directional. It can, on occasion, write out of that data bus, and I don't want it to be writing directly into links to ground. So 1K resistors in all of these eight data lines, they are these eight uh, connections here, four to the left of VCC and four to the right. Let's get those resistors in now. So there are the resistors, there's my pseudo ROM, and now the CPU is reading the data from that ROM and it's running completely reliably. The M1 light is flashing on and off. It's actually flashing on and off at a quarter of the speed of the incoming clock, but that doesn't really tell us a lot. What we need to look at now are these address lines, the address bus. We don't need to look at many of them, I'll say put about four LEDs in on A0, A1, A2, and A3. Let's do that right now. And now we can see that there's a binary counting sequence on those address lines. So what the CPU thinks it's doing is stepping through the ROM, picking out an instruction from each different location. Actually, we're fooling the CPU. We're giving it the same instruction for every location in the memory. So our memory can, can completely ignore these address lines because it just contains zero, zero at every address. Now, these four LEDs look like they're counting up from zero to 15. Uh, where's 15? There's 15, and then resetting back to zero. That's not actually happening because when it resets back to zero, the next most significant address line goes high. So let's get some more of these blue LEDs in. Right, now I've got seven LEDs on the lower seven address lines, that's A0 to A6. And we can see now that it's counting up in binary from zero all the way up to, and it's gonna get there any minute now, um, 127, so that's uh, seven lots of ones all high. It's very nearly there. And uh, there it is. So all the LEDs are on, 
as 127, and then again it resets back to zero. But we know that actually it's going to count up to the full 16-bit address count, which is 65,536. Right, I'm going to now add a couple more LEDs. I'm going to put LEDs on read, which I'll make green, and write, which I'll make red. And uh, here they are on pins 21 and 22, and you can see that the read light, the read line, the green one is pulsing, pretty much in sync with the M1 LED, but the write LED isn't coming on at all, so the CPU is not doing any writes on the data bus, and that's because it's just reading instructions from the uh, pseudo ROM. It's reading a whole sequence of no ops, and it's counting up through the memory. It thinks it's reading uh, sequential instructions from the ROM. Actually, it's reading the same instruction over and over again. Right, time to look at a timing diagram, and this one is the opcode fetch. So every time the CPU is reading this pseudo ROM, reading the 00, zero opcode, which is just a no operation, it has to toggle certain lines. And you can see here that the read line goes low for slightly less time than the M1 line goes low. We can actually see that happening there. The M1 lights up a little bit ahead of read. And so we can see that this is actually working. So M1, the yellow light, tells us that we're doing an opcode fetch. Read, the green light, would normally be uh, routed round to the ROM to actually enable its outputs. And the address would be also routed round to the ROM to select the address location for the data we want to read. Right, time to add another LED, and that's this one, memory request. Now look at this one, this one actually goes low twice. Once, where it puts the contents of the program counter onto the address bus in order to read the ROM, and another time when it puts a refresh address on the address bus, and that's for dynamic RAM. It is all a bit complicated, but let's plug this one in. Now this needs to be active low, so it goes pin 19 to positive, and we can actually see that double pulse. The read line only pulses once, so that's there. The memory request line pulses twice, so certainly what we're seeing ties up with this waveform diagram. Now I've just put in an eighth blue LED, so this is on address line A7, and now something seems to be going a bit wrong because that address line is flashing on and off. So no longer do we have this nice neat counting sequence because one of the address lines seems to have gone a bit mad. What's actually happening here is that the CPU is alternately putting out memory address uh, locations with refresh address locations for dynamic RAM. So by going beyond seven LEDs, things start to get very muddled. So it's probably better if I take that LED back out and continue without it. Now, remember I said that the M1 signal is flashing four times slower than the clock input? Well, there's a reason for that. Well, that's because the no operation code, there it is, no op, there's the binary value, it's all zeros, that's where I tied all my data lines down to zero. This no operation code takes four T states, that's four clock cycles, to execute. So why don't we redo the ROM so that it's a different instruction that takes a different number of t-states. Right, I've now reprogrammed my ROM. Well, all I've done is move a couple of resistors so that it's not reading no ops anymore. It's actually reading uh, hexadecimal 09. Now, these data lines are all mixed up, so it doesn't look like 09, but that's what it is. And that's this instruction, add to the HL register, uh, another register. I'm using BC. But the important thing is that this is 11 t-states long. So now it's all a bit slower. The M1 light is only coming on for every 11 pulses on the clock. Everything else is the same. M1 and read both come on almost together. Memory request is pulsing twice, same as before. The address bus is counting up. And that's because this instruction, add HL, BC, is just one byte. It just takes longer to execute. Now, there are more than a hundred different instructions in this uh, Z80 that I could program into my pseudo-ROM and get different combinations of uh, flashing lights, but 
I think the point has been made. The Z80 can be powered up on a breadboard. You can simulate a ROM so that it can read instructions in. It's currently reading that instruction 09, 11 T states, so 11 uh, flashes of the input clock to every flash of the M1 signal, and it's counting up uh, on the memory address bus. Or you can have the much faster and actually more pretty in terms of flashing LEDs, uh, no op with all zeros here, so that the M1 light lights every four clock pulses. And uh, how about this one? This one is uh, the instruction load an external memory address pointed to by the HL register with an immediate bit of data and that's instruction 36. I'll put 36 on the data bus. Of course that means that the data is also going to be 36 but let's not worry too much about that. So that does two reads. You can see that the read light flashes twice but then it does a write and it writes to a memory address pointed to by the HL register. Now I've no idea what the HL address is pointing to so of course the address bus just looks like it's going completely crazy. But this is the first instruction that I've actually executed where the write light comes on. So it is writing to this data bus. So it's probably a good thing we've got 1K resistors in there now rather than wires pulling directly down to ground. So yes, you can use a Z80 CPU to flash LEDs. It's quite complicated. You do need to do a fair bit of reading through the data sheets. But I have to say that's the most fun I've had uh, with a Z80 CPU probably in the last 20 years. Now interestingly this Z80 is getting very very warm. Interestingly in the Z80 data sheet uh, DC characteristics there's really very little here about how much current you can drive from each of the outputs. Um, there's just this rather bland statement note, all outputs are rated at one standard TTL load. Well, I've looked up a standard TTL load and it's 1.6 milliamps. And I know that I'm drawing one heck of a lot more than 1.6 milliamps for each of these LEDs. I mean, the resistors I soldered to the LED legs are only 150 ohms. They were the only ones I could find in this tiny eighth watt format. So I think I'm massively overdriving the outputs of the Zilog Z80 CPU. Unlike a microcontroller, where all the I.O. is designed to drive reasonably heavy loads, these pins were never designed to drive LEDs. It was never meant that a Z80 would have LEDs on all its address and, uh, and uh, control lines. So there it is, flashing LEDs Z80 style. And actually, if you want a quick and dirty 7-bit binary counter, why not use a Z80? Cheerio.